Welcome to the Shetland Times podcast. I'm your host, Thor Holt, and today's guest is Anne Cleves, the author of the Vera Stanhope novels, of course, and the Shetland books. Please enjoy my conversation with Anne Cleves. Now, I'm not a soothmoother, although I sound like one. I was actually born in Shetland, but could you tell me the story of how you how you first got involved in Shetland, Anne? Yeah, sure. Uh, I first got in Shetland, quite involved in Shetland, quite by chance. I was needing a job. I dropped out of university and needed somewhere to work. And quite by chance, I met someone who was coming up to be assistant warden in the Bird Observatory in Fair Isle. Mm -hmm. And he was moaning a bit about what a cold and windy place it was, and he wasn't sure that it was a, a good way to spend a summer. And I said something like, oh, I'd love to spend a summer somewhere like Fair Isle. And he said, if you're serious, they're desperate for an assistant cook. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I got there. And I'd, at that point, I don't think I knew even where Sarah was. I think I thought maybe it was one of the Western Isles. <laughs> uh, but of course, I, went, I had a look on the map and saw that it was part of Shetland. And that, that was how I got there. And I came into Sarah on a gusty day, very seasick on the Good Shepherd. But... As soon as I came round, I fell in love with the place. And you found out he was exaggerating about the weather. <laughs> uh, no, I think he was understating the weather maybe a bit. <laughs> but it was good. No, I, I really enjoyed it. What, what year was that then that you first went to That was to 1975. Fair yeah, wow. 1975 I, went, I first uh, went there. And then went back in 76. Um, and obviously made friends in Shetland, made friends on the Isle, but kept coming back to visit. So was that chap that invited you to go with him, was that the chap that later became your husband? No, no, that was somebody completely different. He came, Tim, my husband came as a visiting bird watcher later that first year and then came back the second year. We are both still friends with Peter, who was the assistant warden, though, who now lives on Isla. Now, is it a coincidence that Isla is the name of a whiskey? Because I'm sure when I did a bit of research on you that there was whiskey involved in yourself and your husband getting together. Well, it was only that uh, I did notice that when I showed Tim into the dormitory where he was sleeping, that he had a very nice bottle of malt whiskey tucked at the top of his rucksack. And it <laughs> seemed, seemed he might be a good person to get to know. And he was. And he was, yeah. Fantastic. So your latest book, which I nearly had sight of and was going to read before this interview, but it hasn't showed up in the mail. Your latest book, Cold Earth, is yes. now from my reading up on this, it's your 30th book in 30 years. And I suspect that, doesn't, right. that doesn't even include all the short stories that I think you That's produce. right. No, that's just, just the novels. So 30 novels in 30 years. Yeah, I've done one a year since I was first published in 86, but it was really the Shetland books that changed my career and made it possible for me to give up the day job. Uh, so the first book was called Raven Black and that really was a career changer for me. So I'm all, I'll always be very grateful to Shetland for that. That's fantastic. What is your, I mean it sounds like a massive high productivity rate to me, what's your discipline or your process for for producing so much work or is it some kind of coffee whiskey combo that you're, <laughs> that you use? No, no. I just love it. That's the fun bit. I love getting up in the morning and making stuff up. It's just telling stories. It's what kids do in the playground. You know, it's all about about games, really, and playing. And I love that. Could you give us a little, just a little teaser of what's in Cold Earth, then, what it has in store for us? Yeah, Cold Earth. It's just out in paperback now. So it's, it was based on the landslide. It starts off. The idea was triggered by the landslide that happened, I think it was 2004, wasn't it, in the island, when the, the hill to the south between uh, Lowick and Sombra, there was a major landslide that cut the road in half. I remember coming into the island and still then, a couple of months later, it was still single line traffic going backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. And just this idea of a landslide which hides things because the the peat and the soil tipped down the hill but also when that happens things suddenly emerge out of the hillside and so that that seemed like a nice image to use for crime fiction for a 
secrets that remain buried and then secrets that emerge out of the out of the, the soil as well. Great. And you mentioned stories there. And do you, have you got a favourite story or experience from one of your times in Shetland? And I guess the second part to that question, which I don't know if you can address or not, but it fascinates me. Did any of the characters that you actually met in Shetland then come through in some form, even if you can't tell me who they are, in the in the books and I guess later TV series that we read, see, and hear? Uh, I guess the only person really that that I could recognise is um, when I was living on Fair Isle, there was an elderly crofter called Willie, Low Willie, um, who was a great friend, and I'd loved going down and speaking to him. And he was he was a little bit lonely because he'd had no family, he'd never married. Mm-hmm. And although obviously his neighbours were very kind to him and helped him out, he was still quite icy. It felt to me as if he felt that he'd missed out on not having a family there. Yeah. So I'd go down and he'd just tell wonderful stories about the island and... Uh, and I, I think he appeared very as Magnus Tate in the the first book, and um, and that was the character that was played by Brian Cox in the drama. Brilliant. So that's an old friend of Jimmy Perez. Then is Magnus yeah. Tate? Isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he is. He, he, I've moved moved Willie from Fair Isle into south of Shetland mainland. He he might have enjoyed that for the for the extra social life he was going to get <laughs> when he moved. Yeah, I mean, I've moved him. Fictionally, he he died when he was still on Sarah, but he had a lovely, happy ending to his story because his nephew, who lived in in Shetland mainland at the time, uh, came and took over his croft and um, and lived with him. And he married a cook a couple of years after me at the observatory. So Ingrid and Jerry moved in with Willie, and he ended up his days actually having very much a family because they had three small girls. Mm-hmm. So the last time I saw him, Willie was telling the three little girls the same stories that he told me much earlier. Superb. And I mean, I'm from Shetland originally, and there was an old crofter chap and a, an ex uh, seaman called John Jimison who lived on Papastur, and he and I used to enjoy sharing whiskies together when I was home at Christmas. And yeah. um, I wonder if, was that part of your experience with, did you call him Low Willie? Was that the name? Yeah, Low Willie, because his croft was low. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this guy, he, this chap would have been called uh, John Amidsetter, or, you know, you named yeah, people after their right. crofts. So was that that's the same right. on Fair Isle? Very much the same on Fair Isle, yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, Willie knew that he had to give you something when he came in, because that's what people did to be hospitable. And most people, when you went into the houses, you got tea and home bakes. But, well, he didn't really do tea and home bakes, but he would do a small dram whatever time of day you were in to call to chat. Good man. And it wasn't that he was a boozer and it was just that he wanted to be hospitable and give you something. Yeah, superb. Low willy. Nice one. So what idea or or writing project are you most fired up about right now, Anne? Or is it just all about um, kind of getting out and talking about the new book? How does it work? No, that's pretty much finished now because I did a big tour with the hardback in the autumn, came mm. up and launched it in Shetland, which is what I always do with the Shetland books. We had a, a lovely event in Muriel and then did some teas in community halls mm-hmm. uh, afterwards. So so that, the big tour was really in the autumn. Um, and I'm just starting what will be the very last Shetland book. So that's I want it to be be as good as it can be so I'm struggling a bit to get the ideas and to get it started why would you say it's de- definitely the last is that how would you make that decision I think because I've I I think it would be stretching credibility a bit far to do any have any more murders on <laughs> that <laughs> <laughs> yeah consider I kind of your... run out of things to say about the islands I think yeah. and I I want it to stop while people are still enjoying the books rather than before they think that I'm getting repetitive. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So which of your many, many books would you choose to introduce a potential new reader to your writing, Anne, and why would that be? I think start with Raven Black, because I think that is the first of the Shetland books. Um, If you enjoy it, you'll have another seven to read, and that's always a treat, isn't it? I love it when I'm a reader, if I read the first in the series and I look in the front and see that there are other books that I can catch up on. Um, And I think it's probably one of my better books too. 
So what's the tell us that I have actually read about this, but what what's the kind of the story of Raven Black? How did that come into your head? Like you talked about ideas and potentially sometimes struggling to find ideas. Where did that idea yeah. come from? That came because we were up in Shetland visiting friends and because there was a very rare bird that my husband wanted to see and it was on Cleckelin Loch in Lerwick. And uh, we decided we day trip it, which is a bit bonkers. So I got the ferry, got the North Link overnight and then sat there to look at this bird when it got light, finally. Uh, but it was a beautiful day. It was one of the most beautiful days I can remember in Shetland. It had snowed and then frozen on top of the snow and very clear and very still. And of course, the ravens look very black against the snow. And because I'm a crime writer, I thought if there was blood as well, that would be quite a stunning visual image. And so that's how Raven Black started the first Shetland book. So at the time, I was writing in the middle of writing something else. But it took hold of me. I thought at first it might just be a short story, but it, it went on to be a novel. Yeah. I, I actually find with Shetland itself, it's a place of contrast. And you talk about the contrast of the, the black raven against the white snow. Do you think there's maybe something in that, the power of contrast in terms of, well, you're having all these murders set in Shetland. And uh, those of us who are from there know it's generally a pretty low <laughs> low crime place. Absolutely. Do you think there's something in that? Yeah, there is. And, and there's also a lovely contrast, I think, between the bare open landscape you can see for miles, can't you? Big sky, no mm-hmm. trees. Uh, and things that are hidden, so secrets that might be hidden. And also the the warmth of the domestic setting. So you, you have this bleak, beautiful landscape and then you go into a, a house, into a croft house and you're sitting by the fire and you're chatting and there's that wonderful warmth and um, friendship that you get inside the houses. So I think that's a lovely contrast too. Nice one. Yeah, that's kind of taken me back to my childhood when you when you said that, actually, just various warm fires and old crofters. I love that. Thank you. And just, <laughs> and just chat, yeah, and just stories again. Yeah, no screens. Well, there might have been a TV on in the corner in later years, but basically no screens, just stories uh, and conversation. Right. You're right. And smoke in those days. Yeah, peat smoke, that wonderful smell. Pits. Pits and also Peace. cigarette smoke back in the day. Yeah, a, that's right too. Yeah, plenty of that. I, I listened to a play of yours the other day, and it was a, a BBC Radio Four play, which I found White Nights. In it, all oh, right, yes, that's the adaptation of the second book. Yeah, it was brilliant. I was totally gripped. So thank you for that. Entertained me all Sunday morning. Good. But it, it yeah, kind of... that, that in that uh, Stephen Robertson plays Jimmy Perez, and of mm-hmm. course he plays the sidekick. Sandy Wilson in the TV drama, so it yeah. was great to, to get a real Shetlander playing both those characters. Yeah, it was it was really really lovely to hear his Shetland voice actually. But what it made me think, or the question that it kind of brought up for me, Anne, was: Are your books available on Audible for the busy crofters, fishermen, or perhaps hungover students somewhere who might yeah, like to listen they, to your work rather than are. read them? Yeah, they certainly are. So they're they're not read by Stephen, though. Unfortunately, they're <laughs> read by Scott. But I think I think he does it very well. So uh, yeah, no, that all the books are available. So all your books are on Audible. Are they all read by the same narrator? Is that what you said? Uh, I'm not sure. I think the Shetland ones all are. Uh, maybe the early ones aren't. I'm not sure. I don't need to check that. I don't know. Great, but they are on Audible, that's the main thing. Like For me, it's a huge way of consuming books these days, and maybe I'm getting lazy. I love reading, but I also love listening on Audible, so I'm delighted to hear that you've had that yeah, happen. And it's, it's great for people with a visual impairment as well that you have that, that ability to listen. And I, I've done quite a few reading groups with visually impaired people, and that's fascinating because they don't only talk about the content of the story, but about the interpretation by the reader. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my grandmother is now in a home and unable to do pretty much anything other than listen to audiobooks. So perhaps I'll be introducing her to your books as there are plenty of them to keep her going yeah, <laughs> through the long days good. and nights. So how can our Shetland Times podcast listeners connect with you, Anne, if at all? Is there a preferred social media account or place that you would suggest people go to find out the latest happenings with you? Well, I have a website, and all the events are on that. 
and that's just ironcleaves.com. Uh, and that, yeah, that has a list of where I am and what I'm doing. So if people want to come along to meet me, they can find out where I'm going to be on that. And I love Twitter. I do a lot of Twitter, tweeting. What's your Twitter handle? It's at Ancleaves. Oh, you got in there first. Sometimes I find famous people and writers such as you have been <laughs> a bit late to the party and some fan has got their name, but it didn't happen to Yeah, me. no, no, it's at Ancleaves, so that's dead easy, so... Yeah, follow me on Twitter and I'll, I'll I just like it because it's like snatches of overheard conversation. So it's a bit like eavesdropping, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly and can it's be. very quick and easy. Well, it can be like eavesdropping or you can get into an enraged Barney with somebody <laughs> for no particular reason. Yeah, one of my favourite uh, Twitter as tweeters is uh, the Shetland janitorials because they're just so funny. Have you seen their tweet? No, I'll, I'll have to go and follow I'll them. That's look, brilliant. They yeah, don't, they're you, really good. Shetland Janitor, <laughs> is it Shetland Janitorial Supplies? Is that the, is yeah. that the company? Brilliant. Yeah, okay. it's I'll, them, and they, they do some hilarious tweets. I like it. Thank you. We might try and get them on the show since you've maybe Are they've you got sure? a real wit in, in that business who could, they who have could a, come on. They have a real wit, and they, they seem to like crime fiction because I know uh, Iesa Sigurdardottir, who's an Icelandic crime writer, is a great fan of their tweets mm. as well. Fantastic. She's got one of their T-shirts. Well, I will definitely be aiming to try and get those guys on the show. I love it. Thank you, Anne. Before you go then, what is the best... I should have given you time in advance to think about this one. What is the best advice that you'd give to someone who is considering either just a trip to Shetland or actually living in Shetland for a while? I think, well, if you want to live there, you need to go up in the winter and make sure that you could stand the dark days because not everybody can. If you're just going for a visit, go up in midsummer, go up in June and see all the seabirds and the flowers because that's the most beautiful time to go, I think. And if you're a visitor, go for one of the Sunday teas. Have a look in the Shetland Times, because they're listed there, and choose somewhere to go, and it's a great way to meet local people, and you get the best home bakes ever. Nice one. And is there anything I've missed that you would like to say to Shetland or to to anyone, just in general? Uh, just a huge thank you to Shetlanders for being so hospitable and making me so welcome and helping with the, the filming too, because I know that it can be quite disruptive having the BBC there. Uh, and I know they'll be back very soon again. But um, no, so just a huge thanks to, to all your readers. Fantastic. Thank you, Anne. Thanks so much for coming on the Shetland Times podcast. We really appreciate your time. And yeah, it was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.